Mark chapter 5 ended with the Markian sandwich of Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead, surrounding the woman with a 12-year history of internal bleeding. And here in chapter 6, Jesus starts off going to his hometown. But Mark does not give the name of the hometown, at least not in this chapter. Now Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did he get these ideas? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offence at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own house. He was not able to do a miracle there, except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed because of their unbelief. Then he went around among the villages and taught. So verse 1 and 2 are standard fare that we've become familiar with. But then in verse 3 on, Mark starts to get historicising. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't these his sisters with us? And he was not able to do miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. This is a substrate for the argument from embarrassment. Why would Mark include this if the whole thing was a fiction? What purpose could it serve? It's not part of a Markian sandwich to help us divine its meaning either. It describes a fairly down-to-earth phenomenon that we can all recognise. The historicist interpretation of these few verses can, however, be countered. Why doesn't Mark mention the name of Nazareth, assuming that's where Jesus came from? Is it because he doesn't want to give a clue to his readers where to go and find evidence of a real Jesus? Also, there's something of an inconsistency because the first two verses have the typical response to Jesus, but then despite this response, they reject him. And notice that it's the same people who have the positive response as are doing the rejecting. It's not a different group. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did he get these ideas, what wisdom, etc., what miracles, and so on. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, his brothers, his sisters are here with us? And so they took offence at him. So it's the same people. Another point is that Jesus seems to be describing himself as a prophet. Not the son of God, nor a teacher, but a prophet. Elsewhere, Mark calls him the son of God. So why the discrepancy? He's not quoting anything else that we recognise. Could this be a trace of an earlier Jesus story? If so, then the existence of an earlier story about Jesus the prophet tends to argue for historicity. From the mythicist's point of view, Mark has a problem. He needs to locate his Jesus on earth in time and space. But if this is the case, and he was trying to historicise a mythicist church, it's likely that he had been doing it orally prior to writing down his gospel. He therefore would have encountered all the objections, one of which is likely to have been, well, I never heard of this Jesus, where did he come from? What about his family? Mark's job of sidestepping this would have been very much assisted by the highly destructive Judeo-Roman war that was either ongoing or had just finished at the time of his writing. But nevertheless, questions like these are likely to have been asked and therefore Mark was likely to be motivated to head them off. And that could be what this passage is about. To make the most historically explicit statement of Jesus' origin in his whole gospel, coupled immediately by a rejection of his message by those who could have transmitted the historicity orally. However, this analysis is rather undermined by the next passage, from verse 7. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and to put on sandals but not to wear two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the area. If a place will not welcome you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. Sending out this battery of twelve disciples preaching and healing and casting out demons undermines the idea that Mark was trying to explain why his readership had not previously heard of this historical figure. This is quite an unsecretive act of the normally secretive Mark's Jesus. 
and it illustrates the advantage of looking at a gospel in the whole rather than picking out specific passages that support your own preconceptions. Next we come to an aside about the death of John the Baptist which is separate from Mark's narrative and it seems to have been bolted on because Mark wants to tie his hero to John who apparently was a very important first century Jewish holy man. Josephus also tells us about him and there are some parallels with Mark's account. Verse 14 Now King Herod heard this for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead and because of this, miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. Others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets from the past. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men, arrested John, and bound him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had repeatedly told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not because Herod stood in awe of John and protected him, since he knew that John was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he was thoroughly baffled, and yet he liked to listen to John. But a suitable day came, when Herod gave a banquet on his birthday for his court officials, military commanders and leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. He swore to her, Whatever you ask I will give you, up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? Her mother said, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she hurried back to the king and made her request. I want the head of John the baptizer on a platter immediately. Although it grieved the king deeply, he did not want to reject her request because of his oath and his guests. So the king sent an executioner at once to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded John in prison. He brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard this, they came and took his body and placed it in a tomb. It's hard to know what to make of that passage. It doesn't contain any interactions between Herod and Jesus. And it's probably a story that was circulating about John the Baptist that Mark used to bolster his hero. But that would work equally well whether or not Jesus existed. Anyway, the chapter goes on with two iconic miracles, feeding the 5,000 and walking on water. Verse 30. Then the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him everything they had done and taught. He said to them, Come with me privately to an isolated place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and there was no time to eat. So they went away by themselves in a boat to some remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognised them, and they hurried on foot from all towns and arrived there ahead of them. As Jesus came ashore, he saw the large crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them many things. When it was already late, his disciples came to him and said, This is an isolated place, and it is already very late. Send them away so they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said, Should we go and buy bread for two hundred silver coins and give it to them to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he directed them all to sit down in groups on the green grass, so they reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He gave them to his disciples to serve the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the broken pieces and fish that were left over, twelve baskets full. Now there were five thousand men who ate the bread. An interesting miracle. 5,000 men, presumably plus women and children, feeding a crowd that was like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus answered the disciples' question saying, you give them something to eat. They reply, should we go and buy bread for 200 silver coins? Not getting the meaning. Then five loaves and two fish, significant numbers. They ate till all were satisfied. 12 baskets full left over. Do you see a spiritual thread running through this picnic? I think it's fairly clear. And the writer of John's Gospel got it when he called Jesus the bread of life. Also notice the unrealistic but purposeful scene setting. 
Mark needs to get the crowd into a lonely spot so they can be caught short without food. Jesus asks his disciples to come away with him to an isolated place and rest because people were coming and going, and notably, they had no time to eat. So they head off in a boat to some remote place. However, not only does the crowd manage to work out where they're going before they get there, but also manages to get there on foot across land before Jesus does. That's pretty improbable, but it's just a plot device. Then they're off across the Lake of Galilee in a boat again for the next miracle. Verse 45. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dispersed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, he went to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. As the night was ending, he came to them walking on the sea, for he wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them, Have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up with them into the boat. The wind ceased. They were completely astonished, because they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Hmm. Immediately. Well, everything in Mark is immediately. Jesus stays with the crowd he's just fed and disperses them while making the disciples get into the boat and row for Bethsaida on the other side of the lake. It's late because that's why Jesus had just conjured up food to feed the 5,000, but Jesus tarries to pray. When evening comes, the boat's in the middle of the lake and he's still on land. Verse 38, he saw them straining at oars because the wind was against them, seems to cover around six hours because as the night was ending, he came walking to them on the water. They thought he was a ghost and were frightened. He called them, got into the boat, and the wind ceased, and they were astonished because they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The loaves presumably refers to the loaves and fish that he had fed to the crowd. What are these loaves? There are five of them and two fish, and what do the loaves have to do with walking on water and calming wind? The theme develops throughout the Gospel, but in Mark 14 we have Jesus takes bread, breaks it and offers it around. This is my body that is given for you. That's the special spiritual meaning of the loaves in the feeding of the 5,000 and the relevance to the scene is the distinction between the physical and the spiritual. The scene is not portrayed as a miracle. Mark is not trying to say here that Jesus was a physical body that was walking on the water. That's not his point at all. And he makes no hay out of such an event. His point here ties in with the rest of what he's saying, is that Jesus is a spiritual person. Spiritual people could drift over water. Spiritual people provide spiritual food. That's why they don't understand about the loaves and why their hearts were hardened. This is also a spiritual reference. This makes a lot more sense than the conventional interpretation, at least to me. Anyway, the chapter goes on with a touch of healing of the sick that's on firmly familiar ground. Verse 53. After they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and anchored there. As they got out of the boat, people immediately recognised Jesus. They ran through that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever he was rumoured to be. And wherever he would go, into villages, towns or countryside, they would place the sick in the marketplaces and would ask him if they could just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. So chapter 6 is the second longest chapter in Mark. Only chapter 14 is longer. It has the prophet in his own town, the aside about John the Baptist, and two of Jesus' best-known miracles, feeding the 5,000 and walking on water. It has titbits for both mythicists and historicists, but overall I'd say it errs towards mythicism because it does develop this clear distinction between the simple physical impressions on the disciples who just don't get it and the spiritual nature of the character Jesus that Mark is trying to convey.